So this is a lecture series on how business can better serve society. So not just generate profits, but also provide fulfilling jobs, preserve the environment, and also products and services that transform customers' lives for the better. Now, in the first three lectures, we've looked at businesses, companies, how they can serve society. Today, we're going to switch track and we're going to look at investors. So these are the people who own shares in companies. So investors are a huge part of our ecosystem. Anyone here who has a pension, that pension fund will be putting money in companies. Even if you were to buy insurance, like home insurance or travel insurance, they will take their money and invest it in companies. And hopefully those profits from those companies will allow the insurance policy to pay out. And many of us in this room will invest in mutual funds like Fidelity or Legal in general, and they will take our money and put them in companies. So what we're going to look at today is how investors can do what I'm, I'm calling stewardship, improve the value of the companies that they put your money into. So I'd like to start by taking you back over two decades, back to 1995. Now, if you're an American, the one place that everybody wanted to put their money was one of Fidelity's funds called the Value Fund. Over the past five years, it comfortably outstripped its peers. And as a result, loads of people wanted in and wanted to buy that fund. So $5 billion of money was put into the Fidelity Value Fund. Now, that might seem to be great news if you were Jeff Uben, Fidelity's fund manager. Right, the bigger the fund, the more fees that you can bring in. And also, you could hire the greatest analysts to work for your fund because they want to work for the market leader. But actually, for Jeff, that was a problem, having such a big fund. Right? Because if you've got loads of money to invest, you can't put that all in one company because you don't want all of your eggs in one basket. So instead, you'd have to split your money across many, many different companies. And Jeff said in an interview that when the fund became big, he had to invest 120 companies. Now, if you're owning 120 companies, you have no idea as to what's going on in every company. You're not able to devote the time and the resources to make sure that each company performs well because you're spread too thinly. It's like being part of 120 sports clubs or 120 hobbies and societies. You don't have enough time to focus on one. So what did Jeff do? He left Fidelity, this fund where he was a superstar. And instead, he set up his own fund, which was called Value Act Capital. And this is a special type of fund. It's called an activist hedge fund. Now, this is one of the most controversial types of fund out there. The word hedge fund immediately has negative connotations. People think hedge funds are evil. They try to make profits from companies. And how do they do that? They pay workers less. They might fire workers. They might demand share buybacks. They might cut investment. So activist hedge funds are seen as evil. And if you have that starting point, you might actually wonder, why am I giving a talk on the role of investors? Aren't investors the enemy? And indeed, there are proposals from the Labour Party here in the UK and uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren in the US to actually reduce investors' power over companies and actually have workers be in charge, have board seats. And that's something we can see in other countries, particularly in Europe, say in Germany and in Sweden. So this idea that investors, they actually have too much control over a company make it focus too much on profits is something that we're going to take really seriously. But what I'm going to show you is that these supposedly evil activist hedge funds might actually create value, not just profits for themselves, but value for wider society. And let me tie up with an example with a real-life company which hopefully all of you have heard of. I'm going to look at Adobe, the well-known software company. Now, Adobe was started in 1982, and it was started because it developed something called Adobe PostScript. So PostScript was a way of having lots of different fonts 
displayed, and also just graphical objects. Now things like smiley faces are really easy, but back then in 1982, a computer did not know how to print them. And in 1987, PostScript became the first computer printing standard. That was a jewel in its crown, but there was more and there was better to come. Six years later, in 1993, Adobe launched PDF, which we all use now. That's the portable document format that allows us to convert any file, regardless of whether it's a Word document, a presentation, a photo, a spreadsheet, into a single format for easy sharing. And perhaps its crowning moment was 2005, when Adobe bought Macromedia, which includes things like Dreamweaver, a way to create your own website. And so for a couple of decades after its founding, Adobe was a brilliant company. But then, like many other companies, like Kodak, which we looked at in the last lecture, Adobe started to lose its way. So Creative Suite, into which it had adopted its macromedia applications, started to have poor sales. People just weren't interested. Now, Apple had been a big catalyst for Adobe's success. They had a five-year license for PostScript when it launched back in 1982, and nobody had trialled it. Apple took a punt, and was why it was so successful. But now, Apple turned and gave it a hammer blow. It refused to allow Adobe's flash on its products, and instead it preferred HTML. And those of you who will have iPhones, you will know that actually it's quite difficult to, use, um, to view some Adobe documents on your phone because of this decision. And also Adobe, they kept designing software for computers, but they didn't realize that people were now moving to iPhones and iPads and Android devices. It focused too much on the desktop. Just like we looked at last time, Kodak focused too much on film when people were now doing digital cameras. And this was really bad. This was bad for profits. Adobe wasn't selling much. But the whole point of this lecture is we don't just care about profits, we care about wider society. Adobe had to fire 2,000 workers across a, um, a three-year period. So what happened? Well, what happened with Kodak was nothing. No investors came in, nobody did anything about Kodak, and that's why Kodak went bankrupt in uh, 2012. But with Adobe, things were different. Why? Because of the activist hedge fund, Value Act. What does the name Value Act mean? We're going to act, and we're going to act to create value. We're not just going to sit back passively. We're going to try to turn around this company. So late 2011, Value Act bought a 5% stake in the firm. And the following year, uh, Adobe decided to appoint one of Value Act's partners, Kelly Barlow, to join the Adobe board. And we often think about these activist hedge funds going after short-term profit, but that's not what Jeff Ubin said. He said, I don't need the quick hit. You can't just keep throwing stuff at the wall. You need to get in there, get the information. Like he wanted to understand the business, not just the profits. He wanted to understand the workers, the culture, and work on a long-term plan that is going to be sustainable. And so what they did is they moved away from Flash. And that's why it was so important to have an outside perspective. Right, Adobe had bought Flash, and so without the outside perspective, they were probably protective of it. They probably didn't want to abandon it because it was their baby that they bought. But Value Act wasn't part of this. That was an independent perspective. They came in and they said, well, this thing that you bought actually it's no longer good for you, just get rid of it. Instead of seeing HTML as the enemy, they embraced it and moved towards it. And in fact, they also changed the way they sell their products. It used to be you paid a few hundred dollars to buy, um, say, a Adobe, um, one of the Ad Adobe products like PDF or Professional. Now, there was a subscription. You just pay them a little amount every month. And why is that good? Well, those of you here, who were here in lecture two, well, you remember that you want long-term pay schemes. If you sell something one time for $500, you as an engineer, you had to make 
pretty sure that you had a product that would sell and hit immediately and generate that revenue. Even in the long term, if that product wasn't successful, you didn't care so much because you'd made the sale. But for a subscription-based model, where you're paying every month or every year, you need to make sure that that product demoed well, but also continued to do well for the long term. So this allowed engineers to think about what products would be good for the long term, not just create that big hit and that big sale. So what happened after Adobe made all of these changes based on what Value Act was, was suggesting? Well, this is what happened to the share price. Some blue, you could see what was happening before Value Act came in and before Kelly got a seat on the board. And afterwards, the stock price tripled over the next couple of years. What the orange line shows you is how the rest of the IT firms did. So it wasn't that just the IT industry performed well. Adobe performed much better than the rest of its peers. And interestingly, Value Act sold out around uh, 2016. Now, the popular press argues that hedge funds come in, make a quick buck, sell out, and then the company just plummets. But actually what we can see was that Adobe did even better after Value Act left. So it wasn't that they were just putting in some quick hits, they were putting in some changes with long-term sustainable value. Now that's just the stock price, right? The whole point of this lecture series is we care about more than just that. What about the rest of society? Well, did customers benefit? And one way of measuring whether customers benefited was were they willing to pay for Adobe's products? Were they integrated with mobile? Were they ones which were effective? And yeah, we saw revenues nearly double from 4 billion to 7 billion. What about workers? Right, successful companies, they create jobs. So the same company which were firing 2,000 workers over the past few years, nearly doubled the headcount from 10,000 to 18,000. And what about taxes? Right, successful companies, they grow, they make profits, and if they are responsible, which not every company is, but responsible companies recognize their responsibility to the public finances, the tax paid actually more than doubled from 200 to 443 million. And I think this is a really important example of the role that investors can play for creating a better society for everybody. And this role and this story goes against a lot of current thinking. Now, I'm going to go back to a, a, a diagram that I've shown in every lecture so far. And apologies for those of you who've seen it before, but this shows that there's a unifying theme behind what I'm saying. So we often think about the value that a company creates as being represented by a pie. And we often think that pie could either go to investors in the form of profits, or it could go to society. It could go to workers in the form of higher wages, customers in the form of lower prices, the environment in the form of lower emissions. And the big fear is that investors are the enemy. In order to try to make money so that an insurance company can pay out its claims or a pension fund can pay its pensioners, you might think that investors will take slices away from everybody else. How does it do it? Cut wages, charge high prices to customers, and maybe just pollute the environment. And that is indeed the view of many people, and these are influential people, and this may indeed affect why we see so many calls to restrict their power. So a, a, a well-known book um, called Capitalists Arise says they call activists terrorists. Terrorist activists might come in, strip out the cash, fire up to thousands of employees, stop trading, and flip the company in a number of years. If that is true, I'd agree with the author. We want to stop investors having a say. And similarly, Marty Lipton, a um, very well-known lawyer in the US who defends against the, these activists, he said, based on the decades of my and my firm's experience of advising companies, activists are really evil. 
But another common theme throughout my entire lecture series is that we need to base our views on evidence. Right? So it's easy just to say, I think activists are evil, they're terrorists. But is there actually any evidence to back this up? And if you're Marty Lipton, if you're being paid millions of dollars by companies defending you from activists, right? It's in your interest to say that activists are evil. So by making these statements, and actually by making such strong statements, they might convince you that you don't need any evidence because these statements are so strong. But the goal of what I'm trying to do in every lecture series is to look at, are these things actually true? And what the Adobe story suggests is actually not the pie-splitting mentality, but what I've always called the pie-growing mentality. Yes, it's true that if you are Value Act, or if you're a pension fund, or if you're an insurance company, you need to generate profits in order to pay your insurance claims and pay your pensions. But notice, all of those investors, they need to generate profits in the long term. Why a pension fund needs to pay out pensions now, next year, and the next 10 years. Most of these insurance companies, they intend to be around for decades. So they know that if they invested in a company, and if they were to, say, cut wages and cut investment in order to generate short-term profits, that would not generate profits in the long term, and it would not allow them to serve their claim. So instead, what they recognise is that the way to actually make more profits, make this blue bit bigger, is not by taking a slice away from somebody else, which we saw on this slide, but actually to grow the pie, to create value by making the company better. And that's what they did. They made Adobe better by allowing it to um, generate better products, do move to a better subscription model, and also move to HTML. That's something that made them a lot of money, but it also made society better off. So we often worry about investors. We'll say, oh, this investor made $1 billion as if that's a bad thing. But again, what we want to look at is, is this something which was at the expense of society? Did they make their money? by cutting wages, or was this a byproduct of creating an excellent company? Now, what I've shown you is not actually evidence. I've just given you one story. I've told you the story of Adobe. And how do you know that I'm not just somebody who's a big defender of hedge funds? I looked at every single company out there, and Adobe was the best example that I could find you. There might be many, many other stories where hedge funds actually destroyed value. So maybe Marty Lipton is right. And we live in a world of TED Talks and books where you often will tell one compelling story and try to pretend that that's what's always true. So I hope that nobody here will be convinced by the Adobe story that I've shown you. I only gave that as an example, but instead what I want to do for the next five minutes is to look at what happens on average. Just like in all my other three lectures, what I want to look at is take hundreds of companies where hedge funds came in. What happened? Did profits go up? And if they did, was this at the expense of workers or was this actually benefiting them as well? So there's a series of really good studies by a Professor Alon Brav. He's at Duke and Wei Zhang. She's uh, at the Columbia University and their various co-authors, where they look at what happens when a hedge fund activist comes in. Now, the first study showed that the stock price increases by 7% immediately. But we don't care about what happens immediately. We care about what happens in the long term. But then they also found that this doesn't reverse in the long term, it stays high. And actually, after the hedge fund sells out, the stock price keeps going up and up and up. So what we saw in Adobe was not one isolated case. That seems to be generally true. Now, if the stock price goes up, we don't know why this is. Maybe it's because they're able to 
get some tax dodging in there and save some taxes. So they actually tried to look at why did the company perform better? And they actually showed that profitability went up so the companies were actually making more profits rather than just paying fewer taxes. But if they were making more profits, how is that? Are they developing better products or are they just paying their workers less? So what their next paper did is they actually got special data, which is known as census data in the US, which was the data on every individual factory that these companies ran or every particular shop if you're a retail company. They went factory by factory and shop by shop and they found that actually productivity went up. What do we mean by productivity? Is that holding constant the number of workers and not even changing the number of machines that you have, they were able to get more with then less, with more with the same. Well, you might think, okay, maybe they're not hiring more workers, but maybe they're just working those workers longer hours and turning it into a sweatshop. But actually, they showed per employee hour worked, productivity went up. And also this happened even though wages did not fall, so it was not that they were squeezing more out of workers, they were just putting in better techniques. Now one concern that we have with investors is when they come in, they lead to maybe some shops being sold or some factories being sold. And that's something that we call asset stripping. But in fact, what these researchers did is they took the plants that were sold by the fund and looked at how they did under their new owner. And what they found was they actually did better. And that sort of makes a lot of sense. So let's say you're the manager of a football team and you've got a great striker, but that striker is just sitting on the substitutes bench. Why? Because you've got two better strikers who are making it into the first team. Do you want to let that striker just sit idle and not get any practice? No, you'll probably sell him to another team. And that sale is not known as asset stripping. That's seen as efficient because you don't want a talented player doing nothing. And similarly here, it might be that a company owns a particular plant and is not able to get much out of it, maybe because it's no longer part of the core business. Actually, in those cases, it's better to sell it to somebody else who could do better with it. And in these things, rather than just giving you words, I like to give you pictures because a picture tells you a thousand words. So what we're going to look at is what happens when a factory or a shop is taken over by a hedge fund. So here, what is called the event year, that's the time the hedge fund comes in. Now what we can see is that in the three years before, productivity compared to the rest of the industry goes down and down and down. And after the hedge fund comes in, productivity comes up. Why? Because the investor is now taking some action and is now trying to make sure that the actual productivity is um, using the best processes. But you might be skeptical. You might think, isn't this natural, right? You underperform and then you just bounce back afterwards. Maybe that would have happened anyway. Even if the hedge fund hadn't come in, right, it would have bounced back. Maybe it just came in because it overreacted to the underperformance, came in prematurely, and the bounce back would have happened anyway. So I think this picture is really convincing. So what that picture does is it looks at two plants which both underperformed to the same degree, the blue one and the red one. Now the difference here is that the blue plant was underperforming and the hedge fund came in. The red plant was an equally underperforming plant in the same industry and of the same size, but the hedge fund did not come in. It's just a matched comparable. And what's interesting is that we see the rebound for the blue plants where the investor came in, but we don't see the rebound for the red plants where there was no investor. So this wasn't a bounce back that would have happened anyway. Had the investor not come in, you'd have stayed underperforming, just like with Kodak, as we saw in the last lecture. 
Instead, by coming in and providing an independent, independent perspective, we saw this as improvement, good for profits, and good for society. Okay, last slide on these studies. What they also looked at was what happens with investment, because that is something which creates value for wider society. Now, what they found was that spending on IT went up, which is probably why there was greater productivity, they were using the better techniques. Now here is something which seems to be on the other side. Research and development, how much money they put into new products, that falls. And that is what everybody's fear is. When investors come in, they cut investment. Why? Because they, might, might, they want to make money now. But what was really interesting is even though the amount they spent went down, the actual number of patents that they produced went up. And actually, the patents end up being higher quality. So that's really interesting. What they found was these investors were able to get more with less. Well, it takes no skill just to spend money. Anybody can spend money without thinking about where to spend it. But what the hedge fund came in, is it, it, what it did when it came in, was it made sure that it spent money in the right ways. And if you'll forgive me for using another football analogy, in 2015 and 2016, let's take Manchester City and let's take Leicester City. Manchester City invested more. They spent more on players. So under traditional measures on investment, they were the better investor. They spent more money. Leicester City, however, spent better. Why? Because they won the Premier League. Despite spending so little money, they got a lot out of it because they spent in the right ways. And I think this is really important because if anybody looks at what happens when an investor comes in and they see these things like maybe investment falling, they might see you selling some plants or some shops, people might say this is asset stripping, this is bad. But in fact, if what they're doing is they're reallocating the limited funds to the best uses that might be actually creating higher value. Okay, so let me just give the takeaways of all of that research. What do we take away from this? And what do you, some of you I know are investors here, or um, some of you just might be just generally interested in business. Some of you will vote for um, parties based on what they're going to do in terms of regulating the investment industry. What this suggests is that investors are not the enemy. It's not that we have a fixed pie and investors are going to try and take slices away from the pie at the expense of everybody else. In most cases, they're allies with the firms in growing the pie and in creating more value for society. Now, how the general public views investors is as the enemy, right? We think of the heroes in business as being entrepreneurs and founders. We think of somebody like Richard Branson, created great ideas, or Reid Hoffman, who created LinkedIn, or Evan Spiegel, who created Snap. Those are the people with huge visions. We don't think much about the venture capital firms, like Sequoia, which put their money into these small fledgling businesses. We typically think, well, they just got lucky. They got lucky on the back of somebody else's idea. And also, we often think that the entrepreneurs like Branson or Zuckerberg or Spiegel, they have the vision and investors just rein them in and say, well, OK, you've got these great ideas, but we need some money. But that's not the bad thing, though. Right? A car has an accelerator pedal, but it has a brake pedal. And actually, knowing that you have a brake pedal means that you can go faster because when you need to then turn left, you know that you can suddenly slow down. If you didn't have the brake pedal, you'd only be able to go at 15 miles per hour, right? Because if you needed to turn, there would be nothing to stop you. And that's indeed the great combination that we have with investors and entrepreneurs. Well, it may well be that entrepreneurs are able to think about many, many ideas. Some of them are crazy ideas. But if you know that if you've got an engaged investor with the long-term interests of the company at heart, they'll evaluate these ideas 
And sometimes they'll tell you not to go with a certain course of action. So as some investors tell me, they see themselves as an independent sounding board to discuss potential strategies and ideas with management. Now, this does not mean that all activism creates value. While I've shown you on average these things work, it doesn't mean that they work in every case. So this doesn't mean that if you're a, an executive of a company, anything an investor tells you must be good and you must listen to her. But what it does mean is that it's a shift in thinking. These people are not the enemy. In many cases, they are allies of you. So I'm going to bring this back to the overall topic of today's fourth lecture, which is stewardship. So what is stewardship? If you're taking the Merriam Dictionary, stewardship is the responsible management of what is being entrusted to you. So if you're the Fidelity Fund, what is entrusted to you is a household may just give you their money. They're saving their money with you for funding their children's education or their retirement. But what I'm trying to stress here is the only way that you can manage money responsibly for the family that's given their money to you, is if you use that money to try to improve the performance of the companies that you hold. Again, repeat this. A family gives their money to Fidelity. Fidelity then buys shares, let's say, in Adobe. The only way that Fidelity can be good stewards for the family is if it makes sure that Adobe does well so that the family gets good long-term returns. So what we're going to define stewardship as is that it's an, it's an approach to investment that tries to improve the value that companies create for society. So it's not just a case of buying shares and then going away for 10 years and then suddenly waking up and hoping, oh, has this company done well? It's instead to be actively involved in how the company is being run and understand it and engage in a dialogue with the company to make sure that they are indeed creating long-term value. Now, <coughs> there are two forms, there are two ways in which an investor can improve the long-term value of the companies they're investing in. Now, the most common way which most people are aware of, is what I presented. That's called engagement, or it's otherwise known as voice. So what that involves is you making suggestions for how a company should do things differently. So it might involve, say, move away from Flash, move to HTML. Move away from selling your products, move to a subscription model. That's what indeed we saw with Adobe, and those are many ways in which engagement happens. And sometimes we can look at ways in which this happens in the UK. So say with Sports Direct, there was engagement looking into their working practices, the allegations that they're mistreating their workers. However, that is not the only way in which you can engage in stewardship. There is another way that you can engage in stewardship, which is by selling your shares and walking away from a company if that company is not generating long-term value. And I'm going to spend my final 15 minutes or so on this idea of exit, because this is something which is often not seen to be good stewardship. People say that actually if you sell your shares and you walk away from a bad company, that is being irresponsible. But what I hope to try and convince you is actually that this could be good stewardship and that could actually surprisingly improve the performance of a company. How? Well, what are the concerns? The concerns that people have is they say, well, an investor who sells their shares, they're just being short-termist. Right? So if there's a company and the company knows that if the company doesn't generate short-term profits, then the investor will sell. Then the company will be forced to generate short-term profits to stop the investor selling. And how will that generate short-term profits? By cutting investment. 
Let me repeat this. The threat of an investor walking away forces companies to be short-termist to stop the investor walking away. And that's why people are worried about investors. They might say, if you don't generate, if you don't pay out enough money to me in dividends, we're going to walk away. And the need to pay out dividends means that you can't invest. But actually, that's not the case. Because it might be the case that investors sell for other reasons. They might sell not because you haven't made short-term profits. They might actually sell because you've made too much profit in the short term. You might think, well, that sounds crazy. But let's take the company Ford. In 2015 and 2016, Ford made record profits in its history. Yet the stock price went down and down and down. Why? Because investors realised, why was Ford making those profits? It was making those profits because they were not investing enough in self-driving cars. So the role of an investor here is actually to make sure that if you are to sell the stock, make sure that you sell your, your shares, not on the basis of short-term profits, but your assessment of the long-term value that the company is creating. So I agree with everybody who's critical of investor selling. If investors sell based on the short term, right, that's no good. That's just like people, uh, a, a boss who fires an employee because the employee has just made one mistake. We don't want to engage in that knee-jerk reaction. However, if indeed the boss fires an employee because the boss knows that the employee has made a lot of profit, but through unethical ways, that's not necessarily a good thing, a bad thing. And similarly, if we have investors who base their decisions not on short-term profit, but the way the business is conducting itself, the way that you're investing for the long term, then that's actually good. An investor who never sells doesn't hold a company to account. You could be a company like Kodak, ignoring the change in digital technology just sitting back and producing film. And if your investors are just asleep and doing nothing, you don't need to change. But if you have investors who say to you, we won't sell if you don't hit your short-term profit targets, but we will sell if we see you failing to change the diversity of your workforce or invest in your workers or reduce your carbon emissions, that's something that keeps you on your toes, and that is what I'm going to call good selling. So why I'm calling this not just exit, but monitoring, is that when you decide whether to sell or not, you can't just look at earnings on Yahoo Finance. You need to monitor the firm, truly understand the company, what are they doing in terms of climate change, what are they doing in terms of investing in their employees' mental and physical wellness, what are they doing to promote a diverse environment where everybody feels safe? And those are the dimensions that we want to look at. So this is why I have a quite different view of selling than most of the industry. What they look at is the horizon of an investor. Do you hold your shares for 10 years or do you hold your shares for one year? And they say, well, if you hold your shares for 10 years, you're more long-term, you're more patient, that's better. Somebody who sells their shares after one year, that's no good. But what I say matters is not how long you hold your shares for, which I call the horizon, but, uh, um, so which I call the holding period, but what I'm going to talk about is your orientation. Do you think about long-term considerations? Or do you think about short-term considerations when you choose to sell? And interestingly, it seems strange that people don't like selling by investors because they do like boycotts by customers. Right? If you're a customer and a company is doing animal testing, right, it's seen to be quite good for customers to boycott you. For example, um, about a couple of decades ago, NatWest was funding Huntington Life Sciences, which engage in animal testing. And there are lots of protests about that, 
And customers would walk away from NatWest because they were concerned that NatWest was funding animal torture. And notice here that why they chose to walk away wasn't based on short-term profit, but was based on ethical considerations. So if indeed customers can walk away if a company is being unethical, then it's actually fair for investors to walk away if a company is generating profits unethically. Now, if you're an investor and a company is being unethical, the best thing for you to do before you sell is actually to engage and speak to management and try to get them to change. But no matter how much you try to speak to management and get them to change, in some cases, they refuse to listen to you. So some of you will know the collapse of Carillion, the outsourcing company in the UK, which lost a lot of jobs and a lot of money. Now, the government report in Carillion showed that actually some investors, in particular Standard Life, they tried to engage as early as 2014. But the board just refused to listen to Standard Life's concerns. Standard Life tried and tried and tried, nothing would change. So Standard Life chose to walk away and that, that saved their own investors millions of pounds. So what we want to do is we, don't, we want to try and stop thinking about this idea that we don't want investors never to sell. Instead, what we want to make sure is we want to make sure that they sell for the right reasons. And how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to get to that um, in a couple of slides time. But before I get to that, I want to make some, I want to provide some evidence for what I've just said. So before I get to the evidence, just one more point on, the, um, actually, let me get to the evidence actually straight away, just so that I have enough time for questions. So is it indeed true that selling your shares could be good for a company's long-term value? Now, right now, there's a big concern about people selling their shares too much, and that's why in the European Union, they're having a tax on selling. But notice that these concerns are not new. If you go back 25 years ago, there was a big concern back then that in America and the UK, people were selling their shares too much, and we wanted to adopt the Japanese model, where nobody ever sold anything. Now, what we've seen in the intervening 25 years is the Japanese economy has not been the success story that everybody said. Now, that could clearly be for many reasons, not just the fact that it's difficult to sell shares, but that at least is consistent with the fact that this idea of selling, if it's for the right reasons, might actually be, be good for company value. But the big question is, is the selling for the right reasons? Sometimes it is indeed not. We have these high-frequency traders who flip the company within a couple of seconds. Clearly, they don't have enough time to understand corporate culture and employee diversity and so on. But they're not all the investors out there. So this is what a study did. What a study looked at is what happens when you change the ease in which you can sell your shares. And indeed, there was a law change in the US in 2001. Before then, you had to quote the price of a share in one sixteenth of a dollar. A sixteenth of a dollar is about six cents. So if the share price was now $10, you, if you sold the shares, you had to move it down by at least six cents. So from 10 to 9.94. So you'd have to pay six cents to sell. What they did was they changed it from 1 16th to 1 cent. So now, if you sold your shares, you'd sell it from 10 to 9.99, not 9.94. So it's easier to sell because you get a higher price. And so trading became much easier after that. And interestingly, what we found was that trading improved long-term firm value. It didn't actually reduce it. And it improved firm value, particularly for companies with large shareholders. And that is the answer to the question that I mentioned earlier. How do we make sure that when investors sell, it's for the right reasons? It's because they're looking at long-term considerations, not just short-term earnings. What matters is we want large investors which have a lot of skin in the game. 
which to close the loop goes back to what I said right at the start of the lecture. If you own shares in 120 companies, you just don't have the time to figure out how is each company thinking about the mental and physical wellness of their employees. You can't look at anything beyond short-term earnings. But value at, they held 10 to 15 companies. There are other, there's other portfolio managers I know have been at these lectures in the past who own 30 companies and they take a deep interest in every single company that they own. So rather than wanting investors never to sell and creating long-term investors, I think what we need is we want large investors. If you've got skin in the game, then you've got a lot of incentive to understand what the company is doing far beyond short-term earnings. And so my final slide before questions is what are we going to do about this? Right, a lot of talking, a lot of evidence, some stories. How do we gonna change the way that investors practice stewardship? I do think things should be changed. Now, many people will argue the way that we should change things is stop investors having control completely and have workers make all of those decisions. But what I'm suggesting is, well, that's not supported by the evidence. The right investors do create value for themselves and for society but it's only the right investors. Not every investor acts the way as value at. So how can we make sure that investors are these responsible stewards? First, as I think an investor needs to define their stewardship policy. In my first lecture, I said that a company should define its purpose. So for a pharmaceuticals company, it might be to make drugs to transform people's lives. For a toy company, it might be to make toys that educate and entertain children. And similarly for an investor, there might be certain investors who actually think, well, the way in which we're going to engage and improve company performance is we're going to focus on workers. We're going to make sure that these companies invest in mental and physical wellness and diversity and human capital development. Other investors, they might be good at capital allocation or they might be good particularly at sort of te uh, technological intensive companies. And there might be companies who try to engage through voting. But different companies practice stewardship in different ways. They need to define what are the ways in which they will be partnering with companies to improve long-term value. Then, what, once you've said what you want to do, you actually got to do it. And so how are we going to make sure that you do this? Well, I think one important thing is to make sure that you have large stakes in every company that you own. It's no use holding 120 companies, but 30 to 40, you may well indeed have a hope of understanding the company's business model deeply. Won't go through every point because I want time for Q&A, but another is the incentives. So if you're a fund manager and you're paid according to your performance at the end of the year or at the end of three months, you don't want to bother turning around a company because that takes many, many years. But instead, if fund managers are paid according to, say, maybe five years' performance, or they're forced to hold stakes in their fund, which they can't sell for five years, then their horizon is different. And finally, it's useful just to communicate your stewardship outcomes, is that you want to report not just on your financial performance, but actually on things that you've done in, in terms of engaging with a company, maybe to change their business model or to change their carbon footprint. These are things which I think are just important to society as, gen as the returns that they generate. And interestingly, when you think about the stewardship policy, you should also have a policy on when you will sell shares. At the moment, companies, investors don't have that policy. So you do indeed have many investors who sell their shares just because they perform badly in the short term and they're trigger happy. But if you instead say, I've got a policy that when I sell my shares, I will never do this on the basis of a short term reaction to low profits, but I'm going to do this only if the company is not investing for the long term. That is a powerful statement. And then you've got to do it and you've got to back it up. And then it may well be that after the fact, for every company that you ended up selling, you have to justify to your own investors, was this in accordance with my policy to make sure that you're indeed practicing what you preach,
which is to make sure you make these evaluations on a long-term perspective. Yeah, that's all that I, I have for you. And, and as usual, I'd, I'd be really happy to hear questions. And as I say in every lecture, please do feel free to challenge me. So I only give one view on this topic. There's many other people who have different views. So if there's something that you disagree with or you didn't fully understand, please do challenge me. But we, let's have uh, 10 minutes of questions. Thanks.